Hi, and welcome back to another lecture. This one's on analysis of covariance, or ANCOVAs, as they're known in the business, sometimes Anna Kova, not to be confused with Anna Kovaci, an artist in Romania, or the singing group Ancora, or Anchovies. We're talking about ANCOVAs here. So, what are they, and why do we use them? Um, we'll get to how we use them in general, too, and I'll show you an example in R as well. So, what is an ANCOVA? It's a real simple concept. It's just simply a hybrid of an analysis of variance and a regression. Analysis of variance, as you might remember, is looking at the quantitative response to categorical factors. So we're trying to figure out how much of a response was elicited by categorical treatments. Well, a regression, as you might remember, is the quantitative response to quantitative or continuous factors. So if we're talking about a hybrid of these two, it's really simple. We're talking about a quantitative response to categorical and quantitative factors, okay? So it is truly a hybrid of analysis of regression. Now it's useful because you might find that another variable affected the responses of your categorical, categorical treatments and you need to know what that response might have been. So uh, let's think about some sort of a general example. Uh, you have plants growing in response to nutrients, our classic experimental study in agriculture. The response would be how tall the plants become during the experimental time, uh, you know, growth measured in centimeters. And you might have treatments, simply no, low, medium, and high nutrient levels, right? Well, so far, that's simply an analysis of variance. That's easy. Uh, but what if there was some added factor that affected plant growth? There might be different amounts of water content in the soils related to uh, the slope or maybe the soil type. And it might be that you hadn't planned for this in the experiment. You measured in the field while you're doing the experiment, but you hadn't set up plots or maybe couldn't set up plots to address that. So an easy way to handle that would be to treat this as this extra variable. You just record water content, you know, percent of weight in the soils, things like that. And then you can handle that by treating this as an extra variable in the analysis of covariance. This covariate then of water content can be analyzed and add it into your analysis of variance. So the ANOVA would simply be the standard one where we look at growth as a matter of, uh, as a response to those categorical nutrient levels. And water would otherwise then be just part of that unexplained residual error. If we had not included it in the model, it would be just contributing to this unexplained variation that's left over, the residual. And that might make the explained variance that we're trying to uh, report as part of the analysis of variance relatively small. In some cases might make it marginally um, non-significant effects of nutrients, right? Depending on how strong the effects might be. Well, if you look into an analysis of covariance and you think about it that way, you say, well, I have the same basic analysis of variance model in there, plus I just simply add in this extra effect of the water content. So I have the categorical treatments of nutrients and my quantitative or continuous variable that is water percent content in the soil. So now we're accounting for this additional factor and we can reduce the unexplained variance that would be otherwise just thrown into that residual term. We're taking part of that residual that was due to the water content and separately assigning it a unit of variance in our model. Okay, So why do we use these things? What really good is it? I mean how is it really that different from just throwing a bunch of variables into a model? Well, as I might have uh, hinted well enough, maybe not, uh, if we're talking about an experiment that you conducted, um, you might have found out that there were some things along the way that you wish you'd included in the experiment. Or like I said, you just simply cannot account for everything in the experimental design, but you can collect the data and account for it later, essentially. That's what we're doing with the water content. So it's a handy tool when you're trying to conduct a study and you're thinking about it and there's only so much that you can do. The other part of this is that you might be looking into uh, not necessarily a planned experiment but you want to conduct a study that would be treating a response variable like the number of deer someplace as a function of multiple kinds of data. So land use categories, urban, rural, etc. and maybe a continuous function of distance to the road or some other quantitative continuous kinds of responses. So in this one case I'm talking about experiment where you're accounting for other parts of the variation 
by measuring other data in the field. Another one might be just simply a mixture of categorical and quantitative responses, I should say factors, that predict a response. Okay? So in general, an analysis of covariance is whenever we mix categorical factors and quantitative variables to try to predict some sort of a response. Okay? Now, you can imagine in experiments that's pretty handy and in lots of other analyses of large-scale factors at large regional um, extents, you can't help but mix up categorical and quantitative variables. So in fact, we're conducting analyses of covariance quite often. Okay? So how do we use one? It's really pretty simple. Just talk about this in real generalities and then I'll give you an example. Um, you have to clearly identify which terms are your categorical factors. Now, we've already played with this a little bit in the course of the labs, etc. If you have a quantitative number, you know, let's say I had my nutrient doses were 0, 1, 2, and 3 or something, I would need to identify that as a factor to make sure that R thought of that as a categorical uh, factor, okay? So I say F nutrient just to make sure I'm not thinking of nutrients. So I have this term here that would be called a factor, okay? Once I've clearly identified the things that are categories, and this is mostly a matter of mental exercise that is as for um, R, um, then you would also need to clearly identify which terms are your quantitative factors. And you compute a linear model the same way we might with a regression. Or an analysis of variance, you can compute the linear models as well, right? So it's the same as any standard regression. In other words, regression works with categorical, continuous, or both of these kinds of factors as predictor variables. The need to establish these things clearly is as much so you, that you can communicate clearly to others what you did and what kind of analysis was conducted relative to the study that might have been designed. Okay? So if we clearly identify these categorical factors and continuous factors, compute a linear model, we're pretty much ready to go. Okay? We've got this simple regression that we're going to compute. Let me give you an example in R. Um, here's a data set where weight is the response variable. There were six genotypes for each of two sexes, male and female. Those are the categorical genotype uh, experimental factors, all right? and sex too is categorical. Age, on the other hand, was this continuous covariate that's recorded for the different individuals during the experiment. So we can use these really simple um, statements that you've already seen before. I can say a model is the linear model, right? We're simply doing a linear model regression type thing of weight as a function of the sex times the genotype, because we're talking about these two different factors here in a factorial design. So it's a times, sex times genotype, plus our covariate of age. Another convenient way to see this, you'll see, I'll show you both in just a second, is to simply say, show me the summary analysis of variance for that same linear model, where I specified again identically right here. So this first term will show me the regression coefficients, etc., the details. Summary.aov of LM gives me the simple ANOVA table associated with that linear model. Okay? So here's a glimpse of the data set. Uh, we have a bunch of different weights assigned to these individual animals. There are males, and there's lots more rows. I'm just leaving them out here that include females, etc. There are ages attached to each of these, and genotypes have been identified for each of these individuals. Okay? So it's a fairly long data set. I won't bore you with showing you all those. But let's jump to what some of the data might look like. Hopefully you can read this. It says model is simply LM of weight as a function of sex times genotype plus age. Okay? So I say summary of the model. And as you've seen before in other outputs, it spits out lots of results. The intercept being, remember, the simplest case. So sex F male uh, being second, sex female being first. We would put sex female up here and genotype A. So the intercept, remember, is the female genotype A. And we see that that coefficient is significantly different from zero. Now the other terms are compared to that coefficient okay, in t-tests. So this is the standard LM kind of output. Oh, and notice the ones I circled or squared in red here are not significant. So the sex uh, genotype interactions are all not significant. It's a pretty strong model. We have a pretty high adjusted R squared. Well, let me show you what the summary AOV does. It cuts to the chase in a way. I find this fairly convenient, especially when you're thinking about model simplification. It shows me that overall, that general sex genotype interaction is not significant. The individual terms are, including our covariate age, right? So the AOV tells me the exact same things as this does, but in a little bit more convenient terms, I can see that there's really no need to retain 
the interaction term in that model. Remember, I had a factorial set up. So I can go back to my summary AOV, and I can just simply change that multiplication sign in there of sex times genotype to become just simply sex plus genotype. We're leaving out the interaction term. We're going to report only sex, genotype, and age now. Those are each of the individual three terms. And we see, yep, sure enough, they're highly significant. So now it's useful for me to look at the uh, linear model, the regression model, and its coefficients. Again, sex being female and genotype A as my intercept, and all those other terms are significantly different from that, Okay, which makes sense with my summary AOV. Notice again that we still have a really high adjusted R squared with all those terms in there. So what do we have? This was a simple mixture of categorical and quantitative predictors. Let me go back. We had categorical sex and genotype and the con quantitative or continuous variable age, right? It's really no big deal to do this in R. It's quite simple. Um, we just simply have to think clearly so we can explain to others what it was that we did, right? It's important that we recognize that so that others will see because analysis of covariance means something different from regression or ANOVA, as I'm showing you here. A regression, remember, is, in its purest form, is a quantitative response to a quantitative predictor. Analysis of variance is a quantitative response as a function of categorical predictors. And, as you now know, analysis of covariance is a quantitative response relative to both categorical and quantitative predictors. Okay? So you're already running linear models and analyses of variance. It's easy for you to run these things. It's just a matter of clearly articulating and recognizing that you might have done an analysis of variance relative to an analysis of covariance or a simple regression in the classic sense. They're all using a linear model. They're all using the straightforward mechanism in R, but we have to be articulating clearly what, which one of those functions we're actually doing when we report analyses. Okay, So the mechanics are straightforward and simple. It's a matter of understanding these categories so other people will understand what you did too. All right? That's it. It's real simple. Analysis of covariance is just an extra little wrinkle, but it can be very nice if you have these extra data in an analysis of variance to help report and explain the data much more clearly. Just to try to emphasize that a little bit further, an analysis of covariance sets aside, well, I'm sorry, let me go to um, this one. Analysis of covariance sets aside the variation in this case, 10, uh, ten uh, sums of squares, or a mean square of 10, um, out of the residuals. All right? So we can explain the variation in our main treatments all that much more clearly because we did this analysis covariance in, in an ANOVA experiment. Okay? And in other studies, like I mentioned, analysis of covariance makes perfect sense because you're relating factors across large areas that might be both categorical and quantitative. So I think you're going to find you're actually going to end up doing an analysis covariance quite often if you've conducted an experiment or if you just have uh, analyzed lots of data across large scales. All right, I hope that makes some sense. We're going to be using these in a variety of ways the rest of the semester. I won't really sweat which category it was, I think, too often because we're going to be thinking about other mechanics, but you should be able to recognize when something is analysis of covariance versus an ANOVA versus a regression. Okay? It's pretty simple. All right. Talk to you next time. Bye.